I just like oatmeal that way. It's it's just a it's a great crop. It's wholesome. It's it's kind of unadulterated over the years. It's not much different than it was a hundred years ago, and and it just was a good. Thing. Welcome to Funeral Potatoes and Wool Mittens, a show for people who embrace the warm and cozy spirit of everyday living in the Midwest. From the blog Random Sweets, I'm your host, Stacy Mergenthal. Roots go deep in today's show, so come with me to meet fifth-generation farmers Taylor and Cassandra Sumption, the founders of Anthem Oats. The couple grows and packages premium, gluten-free oats for retail on nearly 400 acres near Frederick, South Dakota, which is about 27 miles north of Aberdeen on highway, U.S. Highway 281 and just seven miles south of the North Dakota border. Taylor's great-great-grandpa homesteaded in the area in 1882. Yes, I said 1882. So Taylor and Cassandra are keeping the family agriculture business alive in what's now 142 years. They're focused on value-added agriculture and vertical integration to build their legacy-based farm-to-table company. For us, this means that we can count on them for many years of delicious, steel-cut, old-fashioned, and quick oats, and instant oatmeal cups and packets in flavors like vanilla chai, peach and cranberry, dark chocolate brownie, super fruit, pumpkin pie, and my very personal favorite, maple pecan. So learn more about their products and the family at anthemoats.com, and I also posted on randomsweets.com the photos and recipes that Cassandra shared with us for tiramisu inspired overnight oats energy balls and her bacon cheeseburger meatloaf with secret sauce and hey you know what i know that you have thousands of podcasts to choose from and i'm just so happy that you chose to tune in to funeral potatoes and wool mittens today you're in for a real treat because we even talk about mycorrhizal i can't even say it mycorrhizal fungi taylor and cassandra welcome to funeral potatoes and wool mittens Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Thanks for joining me. I'm excited to learn about you. I first learned about Anthem Oats when I was at Galen's Popcorn in Madison, South Dakota. I was learning about how he has South Dakota products or local there. I guess they're not all South Dakota, but he had a little celebration for National Caramel Corn Day where he had vendors there um, sharing their products. And then that's where I got to meet you, Cassandra. And then was it your son, Preston, that was there with you? Yes. Yep. Preston was with me. Yep. Okay. And so I got some, was it the maple cinnamon or maple pecan oatmeal, brought that home, loved that so much. So I kind of read about you guys and then invited you to come share. I just want to learn all about your operations. And it's just fun to see that there's oats grown in South Dakota and packaged and on the shelves. So why don't you just tell me about yourselves and your family and your operation a little bit, just to introduce you to everybody. Yeah, I, Taylor Sumption. I, I grew up on a on a family farm just southeast of Frederick. Um, you know, growing up on a very diversified farm, they all they all were back then in the seventies and eighties. Um, farm there. Uh, I had no desire to farm. I I loved doing it, but was always told not to because of the eighties. It was really hard mm. and stressful on everyone. Um, went to college to be an ag engineer. I wanted to build farm equipment and. Uh, it wasn't until I went to college I realized I just, I just, just living in town and you know a corporate <laughs> environment. It just was not for me. So, switched majors and graduated from South Dakota State University in '96 and began farming. Cassandra and I met in high school at a homecoming dance uh, my junior year. So, we we've been inseparable ever since. So, <laughs> um, came back started farming. Uh, just saw, you know, a real shift from diversified farms into a, you know, a two crop rotation, just uh, a kind of a vicious commodity cycle and, and always kind of yearned for, to go back to what, what we used to do more diversified, more, you know, some more value added. And, and that was really where the idea for a vertical integrated product, like, like oatmeal or something of that nature kind of came from. Um, we got married in 97. We've got five children. Three of them are out of the house. We have one one at home just about to leave the house. So we'll be down to, to one at home here shortly. Um, but 
Yeah, I just got kind of burned out in the commodity cycle we had. So just looking for, we started growing oats. I really fell in love with it, um, what it did for our soil health and, and everything. It was just a real challenge to try to find a way to make money growing oats. And uh, mm-hmm. that's what started the, the whole process. And it, it uh, I really just really liked what it was doing for our farm. And, and so that spurred the idea and, and a few kind of life altering events led me down the path to like, it's time to move forward th- with this or give up on it. So um, we kind of designed a, a brand around it and, you know, just started troubleshooting ways to, to make it come, you know, full circle to f- through production and, and where we're, where we're at today. Mm-hmm. Cassandra, did you grow up in the Midwest? I grew up about 20 miles from Frederick in a little town called Pecla. And yeah, mm-hmm. just very similar farming and things like that. So yeah, and I grew up with three sisters and my mom. And so yeah, this whole being around boys and farming and wow, <laughs> a little different from this little town girl. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you, so you guys grew up not too far from each other, but you, you, Right? Was we it, didn't know each other. Didn't know each other. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So close yet so far. <laughs> right. Right. Do you have pets? Do you have the the family farm dogs? Yeah, we have two dogs, and they're they're going to be our babies after the kids are all gone. <laughs> <laughs> are any of your kids involved in your operations in your farm? No, not not currently. Our oldest son works for the local co-op as an applicator and uh hmm. and then our son who's graduating high school just in a, in a few weeks here um they they both love agriculture they want to be involved that's that's in, in some fashion I, i'd like to see them work somewhere for a few years and, and hopefully mm-hmm. they could work into work into you know some kind of a family operation mm-hmm. one thing that i know that i don't think you mentioned yet is you're on fifth generation farm land is it the same land the homestead Tell no, me about that. Um, my great great grandfather, he, he came from England, settled in Iowa for about 10 years, and then uh, came up, up to the Frederick area to homestead. I think the land, you know, there just wasn't land available down there. Mm. Um, they came kind of late. So he settled, homesteaded near Frederick on two quarters. It, it's not too far from where we live, but yeah, our. our we have a very large family. It's very fractured. Um, as the generations have gone through, it's it's typically split off every every yeah. generation. So um, we're we're spread out. There's a lot of us, but we're all spread out. So what is that like? 142 years. Yeah. Did you say 1882? Yeah, 1882 when he homesteaded here. Yep. Yeah. Do you have any livestock, or do you just do crops? Um, not right now. We, you know, I grew up on a on a cow calf operation as well. And, oh. Just just split off from from my family farm in the last couple of years, so we don't currently have any livestock. Um, it, we're probably going to work into it. I'm I'm working on some soil health and different things, and I, I don't know if it'll involve us getting back into cattle or you know custom grazing or something. But I I want to integrate livestock into our cropping system. I think it's an important part of it. And I, I could ask you what sort of tractors that you like. People can't see the video, but I see all your John Deere tractors back there. I wore a green shirt today. I didn't even know. So we are set with the John Deere. (laughs) My grandpa, Elroy Moe, he farmed. And then when they sold the farm and everything and moved into town into Brookings, he he worked at Beckman's at the John Deere place in Brookings for quite a few years working on John Deere tractors. And so they're in our blood. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I like green. There, there is a fence up there on one shelf. It's hard to see, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's talk about anthem oats. And then also, I think I is it maple. I'm looking at the back. I saved my box from the oatmeal that I got. Mm-hmm. So Maple Valley Foods is that just kind of the umbrella that you are running under? And then anthem oats is kind of the brand of this product that you're doing. Right. Let's just talk about that. Yeah, Maple Valley Foods is just the parent company. Um, okay. We started that company and a- Anthem is the brand. Yeah, there's a lot of decisions like that you have to make when you start a company and, you know, how you structure all of that. And, mm-hmm. but, yep, that's how we, we where we sit, we're, we're overlooking the Maple River. Oh, okay. So that's where Maple Valley kind of came from. 
All right. So you said oats. So talk about that. Why oats? What What is it with the land? What is it that you like? You know, oats is a, a somewhat of a heritage crop. I mean, you know, it was a crop that was grown here when when our ancestors first homesteaded. It's it's a cool season grass. It uh, it's, you know gets up and going you know early in the year. Um, one thing I noticed is we had you know significant increase in crop yields following our oats and. Uh, I've actually met with USDA as a research farm north of Brookings, and I've I've had some discussion, and they're coming up to tour our, our farm here at the end of the month, mm-hmm. and uh, they've seen the same thing. When for whatever reason, when they introduce oats in their crop rotation studies, they see a real surge in in mycorrhizal fungi and like beneficial bacteria in the soil, and that that's what contributes to those increased yields. But they're they're doing some rotational studies on it now, and I'll be real interested to see, you know, what they come up with. But, um, you know, we saw that on the cropping side. And and one thing it allows is, you know, you break those pest cycles. So, like, rather than using, you know, a traded corn for insect control, you can go back to a conventional hybrid without, you know, having those pest issues. So there's just a lot of benefits to just breaking that crop rotation up, even with just one crop, you know, adding a third crop. So that's what I really saw when we first got into it is, you know, we're seeing a pretty significant yield on either corn or beans following uh, oats. So that's the big benefit that, you know, the other one with oats is a short season crop. So typically we'll take that off and harvest, you know, late July or early August, oh. which allows us to plant uh, a grazing cover crop. And then we can fall graze livestock, you know, into that which allows us to pull livestock off pastures a little sooner. It just, it's a really good fit for a, you know, for a diversified operation. Looks like, like you said, the cool weather. So they're more the North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, yeah. Iowa, Wisconsin goes into Illinois a little bit. And then yeah. did I see Pennsylvania? Did they have? Yeah. Yeah. You get over East there and it's spread out. It's used in a lot of parts of the country, even as far South as Kansas in, in areas, mm-hmm. but um, it doesn't perform as well in heat, you know, so mm-hmm. for feed use, they can use it in those warmer areas, but for a milling quality, you want that bigger growth. It's kind of, you know, from here North is where you see most of the milling oats and the overwhelming majority of milling oats that you would consume today comes from Canada. Well, they have a lot of cold weather up there to grow. <laughs> yeah. And then they're, you know, because of their cool and short growing season, they're limited on the number of crop options. So oats just oh, is a good yeah. fit where down here we have, you know, so many different cropping options that it, farmers typically gravitate to, you know, it's a, it's a very competitive industry. So farmers grow what the best return is, the lowest amount of risk, you know, you have way better crop insurance on corn and soybeans. So mm. farmers just... They're good businessmen, so they gravitate towards those crops that mitigate risk and have the biggest, uh, you know, revenue associated with it. Mm -hmm. So for people who haven't looked online yet at anthemoats.com, tell us what products you carry. Yeah, we've got uh, multi-serve, old-fashioned, which is just a whole rolled oat flake. And then we have uh, an instant oatmeal, which is, uh, you know, a rolled steel cut oats, which is smaller faster cooking oatmeal. And then we have steel cut oats. Those are in our, our multi-serve bags. We sell a 30 ounce steel cut, 40 ounce old fashioned and quick. And then we sell an 18 ounce old fashioned and quick in, in some stores and online. Um, then we have a, like an instant um, mixture. One thing a little different about our, our flavored oatmeals is they're a mixture of old fashioned and instant oatmeal. Oh. So they're not so ground up. There's actually some nice big flakes and a little more texture to it. But we sell uh, four cups, uh, three and a quarter ounce cups. Um, in those, we have super fruit, um, dark chocolate brownie, uh, vanilla chai, and uh, peach and cranberry. And in our cups, we made them about twice the size of anybody else's. So they're, uh, you know, you can grab that, mm-hmm. take it to work. It's a full meal. You don't really need anything else to, to get through the day. And then in, uh, we sell a, a two and a quarter ounce packet, a box of five. And in the packets, we have the maple pecan, uh, pumpkin spice, peach cranberry, and the vanilla chai in the, in the cartons. 
So the pumpkin spice is what I'm going to get next. <laughs> yeah. But the maple yeah. pecan I had, and I put some of the 80 honey on it. I added a little extra cinnamon just because that's what I like. And then I added honey. Oh my gosh, you guys, it's amazing. And I didn't realize that it has some of the full oats. So exactly what I had said to my husband was they're, they're more, I used the word toothsome. <laughs> He's like, what are you talking yeah. about? I'm like, they're just... They're just more hefty. I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. it's just delicious. Yeah, we're about 50 to 60% of our flavored oatmeals is old-fashioned flakes. Okay. Just to get that more texture. And I think, you know, most of the companies in the industry and in their flavored oatmeals use their instant oatmeal. And I think they even use some of the, like, secondary product that's a little more ground up and less appealing. Mm. They kind of use that up in their flavoring and it's, it's really mushy and it just oatmeal powder. It ends up being oatmeal yeah. powder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys have a favorite? Do either of you have a favorite? What's your go-to? You know, in, in the cups, I, I love the super fruit and, uh, mm. you know, other than that, I think the maple and the vanilla chai are probably a tie for me. Okay. I love them all, but yeah, definitely super fruit um, in the cups. And I said, when we were doing our taste testing, I said, I don't care what you pick, but this is one of them. <laughs> and so in the cartons, um, probably, I didn't really like peach and cranberry too. That okay. one maple pecan. Yeah, the peach and cranberry, that's an interesting combination. So yeah, I like it. What about your customers? What do you hear from your customers? Not necessarily about their favorites, but just... You know, what's some of the feedback that you've gotten from? Yeah, well, um, you know, in the multi-serve oatmeals is the flavor. Um, you know, we've had a lot of customers will make cookies or a no-bake bar with with a, you know, a large name brand off-the-shelf product and ours, and they can literally pick out which one has our oatmeal mm -hmm. just by the flavor. Our oats, is a, it's a little darker. If you look at it, it's a little more rich in flavor. We're a little higher in calories and nutrient density than than a lot of the other oatmeals on shelf. I think I think a lot of that is just a little bit of agronomics. We focus a lot on soil health and you know and plant nutrients. So it's you know through soil sampling, tissue sampling, and then we focused on a little more on nutrient values when we pick varieties. Where you know almost all of your mills they want something that mills easy. And typically that's going to be a less nutritious variety. So that's one thing that puts us a little different than, than the rest of the industry. Do you bring your oats somewhere to be milled? Yeah. And in, initially we were milling in, in Fargo and mm -hmm. then we, we had found a plant in Powell, Wyoming and, and they're a certified gluten-free facility. So we just switched last winter to, to that mill just so we can have some assurance that we're gluten-free. We haven't changed our labeling or anything yet, but but we are being milled in a, and that's a pretty common question that we get at food shows and stuff from, from mm -hmm. customers. Um, so we felt like it was a good, a good switch to be able to have some assurance that we're being milled in a gluten-free facility. Um, so right now that's where we're being milled. Our package isn't labeled gluten-free, but I can assure you that it, Okay. It, it, anything packaged, you know, after this last winter is is a gluten free mm -hmm. oat. Good. Okay. Health benefits. I don't know a lot about the health benefits of it. I, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I think there's a lot of fiber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's usually, uh, am I understanding correctly? Well, because of the fiber, I think it can help with regulate your blood sugar levels, and of course, in weight management. It helps you feel full. I know when I have a bowl for breakfast, I'm not trying to snack at 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm really not hungry yet. Yeah, it's it's, it's filling. Um, it does really help flatten out your blood sugar. We we do use sugar in our flavored oatmeal. So I always, the only one with, you know, diabetic or pre-diabetes, I always tell them, you know, the best option in our product lineup is our multi-serve with, you know, so they can flavor it and add fruit or whatever to their own diet. But yeah, there are a lot of health benefits to oats. And one of the reasons I, I picked it, I kind of studied a lot of grains we grow and different things we could do to vertically integrate. And I landed on oats because of the health aspects. There's Cheerios labels heart healthy, and, and they can scientifically back that up because oats is heart healthy. Um, the beta glucan, there's, there's a lot of health benefits to it, along with the fiber 
so that was one of the reasons I, I picked it. And, and another one was, is it's, it's kind of a globally growing cereal grain, which most of them are, you know, diminishing in, in world consumption. Um, even particularly in, in Asia and Southeast Asia, there, there's a growing demand for, for oats. So that, that kind of led me down, well, this is a good product to get into. And, and, you know, ultimately I wanted to be a part of something that's good for you and wholesome too. One thing we'd looked at was using grains to, you know, big, a hot one right now is distilleries and bourbons and, you know, oh, different yeah. alcohols and stuff and which are great. I love those companies, but I didn't know that I wanted to be associated with something that could be damaging to to families at the same time in a way. So mm-hmm. I just like oatmeal that way. It's it's just a it's a great crop. It's wholesome. It's it's kind of unadulterated over the years. It's not much <laughs> different than it was a hundred years ago, and and it just was a good fit. You you talk about the and I and I know that you promote your regenerative um, farming practices. So talk a little bit about why that's important to you and to the environment. Why are you taking such good care of the land? Yeah, you know, ultimately, it, it's what we make our living off of. So that's that's probably the most important thing, right? Out of, <laughs> right, right off the bat. Um, the other one is consumers are demanding it, and you know, and as a producer, you when you have a company like Anthem, the success hinges on your consumers buying your product. So um, I think we we have to have an offering that that fulfills that need. One thing, you know, you hear it all over the news, the carbon, you know, carbon scoring, carbon intensity, these carbon pipelines, there's all these, you know, there's, there's a big focus on that right now. And uh, I think oats can really fill in that space and, and really help out through its, you know, increase in biodiversity and the increase in, in crop yields following oats can lower dependence on, on fertility needs and, and uh, things like that. Things we're doing on our farm is, you know, more intense rotation, cover crops. Um, I'm working with a couple companies right now. There's some pretty neat technology coming down the pipeline where we're going to be able to create our, our own nitrogen fertilizer from, from the air. Um, and that's going to really change the landscape on, you know, on, uh, synthetic nitrogen, which, um, I think that could really change this area and our carbon scoring and, you know, what, what kind of dependence we have on that. So there's a lot of cool things coming in the next 10 years on, on regenerative ag. And, and I think it's kind of a push from, you know, the industry is being pushed that way. I mean, we're seeing it, you know, you go to Iowa, the nitrate loads in the rivers, there's, there's, there's issues mm-hmm. that agriculture needs to work on. Mm-hmm. And uh, the consumers are demanding that as well. So it's a little easier for, a, you know, a commodity producer to ignore those and just keep pushing, you know, what we're doing. But I think eventually we're going to be forced to go down that road if we don't embrace it initially. Sure. So what have been some of the challenges that have come up? Has there been anything that has almost made you just go, we're just not going to be able to do this? Yeah, there's, you know, anytime you start a new company or do anything, you know, out of the norm, there's, <laughs> there's challenges, right? I mean, it's just like, and there's, there's days where you're just pulling your hair out and you're wondering why that, you know, why did you do this? Why, <laughs> you know, why are you doing this? But then you'll get a letter from a customer or you'll, you know, you go to Madison and visit with some, you know, people at Galen's and you hear all the great stories and, and, and it's like, well, that's, that's why, you know, and it seems like every time you get a little frustrated, you have that positive engagement with somebody that, you know, and then you realize why, why you're doing it. Right. How about the process? So when do you, have you planted yet? We're talking what today's May 1st, happy May yeah. Um. So have you planted yet? Walk through yeah. the process of planting, growing, you get it, get the crop out, you're bringing it over to the mill so that once we're eating it for breakfast, we know what you guys went through to get it there for us. Yeah. At oats, you know, oats, we try to get planted as early as possible. So, you know, definitely want it in, in April, if we can even get it in in late March is, is ideal. Oh. It seems like that's a tough, uh, pretty challenging the last 20 years. It seems like we've just been wetter and cooler in these springs, but Mm-hmm. Um, we try to get it planted as soon as we can. Oats will typically mature that last week in July or early August is when we typically harvest it. 
So we used to swap it. Now a lot of these varieties are, are pretty good at being able to straight cut. So we'll straight cut it with a combine directly. Sometimes it's, it's a challenge to get it to dry down depending on weather, but then, then it'll get harvested. If it's not dry, it'll get dried in an air bin. After that, it will go get trucked to the mill. Um, when we were milling in Fargo, it was a two-step process. We had to dehull it first because they don't dehull in Fargo. So being able to go out to Wyoming, it's a little further, but it's a one-stop. They can dehull and mill and everything right there, which I, I like the food safety aspect of that. It's not being trucked after that hull's removed. Mm. Um, they test it going into the mill for gluten, and then they test the finished product for gluten content. So if it, if it throws a positive test for gluten coming in, it'll get rejected. Um, so they're, they have a pretty stringent requirement going into their plant to maintain uh, gluten-free. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to be real cautious of, of gluten grains. That's been a challenge here. You know, um, we don't grow any wheat, rye, barley, anything. And one of the reasons we won't use that and I won't use it in a cover crop is because I don't want to take that chance of, of contaminating our oats with, with gluten. Okay. Um, so that's a real challenge in some parts of the country because they typically have a wheat or a rye rotation or something where then you, that can always be an issue with some, you know, mm -hmm. volunteer crop coming up in their, in their oats, but absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. So then it, it gets milled and put into large totes, like large plastic bags. Um, those get shipped back here to Frederick to our facility here. And we package all the different products here. How many trucks go out to Wyoming? This last year, it would have been, we can get about just shy of 2,000 bushels in a, in a truckload. So like in one year, it would be about 13 or 14 semi-loads. Wow. How, how many acres do you, are you farming oats on? This year, we're going to have about 400. Okay. Then you bring it back to your processing facility. Do you have that right on your, on your property there, on your farm? Uh, not not on our farm where we live, but right in in our local town of Frederick. It's right right in oh, town okay. here. We we sit right on a U.S. highway, so it, it was a it's a good location for freight and mm -hmm. to get product in and out. And then your packaging, you have employees, you have family come help. How does that? What does that look like? Everybody puts on hair nets and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> works with the boxes and my wife my wife and I work here every day, and then uh, we have one one employee from town here who comes out and then that's typically we can keep up but uh if we need to rely on our youngest he <laughs> he would much <laughs> rather be doing something else farming or anything outside rather than packaging oatmeal but he's helped um casey's cassandra's mother's helped family members you know and uh, friends and, and stuff at times but we typically can schedule it right now we can keep up with with what we're selling as long as there's a roof over his head, he needs to come and help yeah, mom and dad, right? right? <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what we yeah. tell him. I remind him that. I, I did a lot of jobs I didn't care for growing up too, but it was all part of being able to live right. in the house. <laughs> right. Didn't we all? I mean, at one time in my life, I was cleaning bathrooms at Canterbury Downs, the horse track up in like oh, near yeah. Shakopee. That was not a very nice job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So then you have them all ready to sell at that point and... Where do they go and how do they get there? Yeah, we, you know, we ship, we ship to a handful of direct stores, um, online misfit market. We sell, you know, direct to them. They're an online retailer. And then Hy-Vee, uh, Ingalls Market is a direct ship. And then a handful of local stores in this area. And that's one of our focuses for this year is to really branch out into a delivery structure so we can really Originally, when we started, we wanted to have a real big presence here locally, like in the tri-state Dakotas, Minnesota, and we we really didn't follow through with that plan. So that's kind of our 2024 goal. Um, and then we shipped through two national distributors, Unify and Kehi, and uh, they go all over the country. Uh, our biggest distribution center would be in Dallas, Texas. Oh, okay. And... We'll we'll talk about in just a minute. We'll go to kind of that retail side where people can actually get your products. But do you do you live by any advice 
that was passed down generation farming. You said at one point you were going to get out of it. They told you you shouldn't farm. <laughs> Is that the advice you're living by today, Taylor? Uh, <laughs> Don't farm. No. You know, I think it's a shame to talk anybody out of a passion they have in life regardless of what that is. And, and, and agriculture, you know, I could go on for hours about the challenges in agriculture, you know, and, and one of the passions I have is, is trying to make that career available to people who want to do it and don't have that connection. Mm. And a lot of times our, our, their biggest adversary is, is our, is our government and how they operate the farm program. As much as they like to believe they're helping small producers, they're really yeah. not. And, so that that's kind of a real passion of mine is, is is that, but I think it's a shame to persuade anybody against something they have a true passion for because, in, you know, at the end of the day in life, that's what you're here for. Yeah. So, so yeah. With that being said, I you know, and, I, and a lot of times when you're being forced to do something, you don't have an appreciation for it, and that's kind of how mm -hmm. growing up on a farm was, you know. <laughs> and it's <laughs> once you have your own life, and then it's your choice, and you're there, you know, you you can really fall in love with it yeah. agriculture is a it's a it's a great way of life it, it has changed a lot in my lifetime and in ways that i think aren't really that beneficial to families and you know it's kind of drifted away from the mother being the homemaker and mm -hmm. you know those those days are over you know with the you know you need access to good health insurance there's all these challenges yeah. that have changed it to me in a negative way from what it was when i grew up you're right. It, it's hard to live on one income. So we end up being dual income. So the mom's working. And like you said, a lot of times that's where the health insurance and things need yeah. to come from, not from the farm. Is there anything surprising that most people don't know about oats? One thing I I always kind of allude to when I, I give a few presentations a year to different groups mm -hmm. and, and uh, I always put together a little slide on, you know, value added egg is a, is a real passion of mine. And, and when I see what it's done, you know, large scale with our ethanol plants, soybean crush plants to then smaller scale through the direct to consumer, you know, meat companies and, and everything that's kind of popped up and, and companies like Anthem is the amount of money it keeps in your community. And, and, you know, when I, I look at like an average acre of, of oats for us, will make over 20,000 cups of oatmeal. And, the value of those cups when we sell them to grocery stores and distributors is over $30,000 an acre. Wow. So you take a crop that's worth $400 an acre and you turn that into 30,000. Now mm -hmm. we spend most of that 30,000. We don't make a lot of money, but mm -hmm. all of that gets turned over here. Right. And that's the difference. And, and to me, the, you know, to, to keep our small towns relevant and, and we have to find ways to leave the value here, to add that process mm -hmm. it. Um, Cause when it leaves as a commodity, you cut out all of those industries and, uh, you know, and even though there isn't that much profit there, all of that money leaves. Yeah. Well, and like you said earlier, uh, consumers are starting to demand that type of thing. They're searching out, they're looking for what yeah. can I buy locally? How can I support and that's what they want to do. So you're kind of meeting the demands of what, what people are looking for. Anyway, yeah. The, you know, the, the real challenge is the consumers are on, on value added egg side. It's, it's very publicly accepted the, the challenge for a company like ours and, and anyone trying to penetrate that large retail space is the entire system is against you. We have these huge consolidated mm -hmm. companies they control the distribution. They control the terms. They're large enough to, you know, to run the stores. You have to find a way to break through that and penetrate that market. And that's, that's the real challenge. And that's the frustrating part for us because the, the consumers love companies like ours. They want mm -hmm. to see them grow. Um, but it, it kind of, it really conflicts with the large concentrated national type stores and and you're even seeing those change shift to regional products and stuff and it's because consumers want it mm -hmm. you know and I, I think eventually the consumer will win you know that but it's gonna it takes time yeah how to get shelf space i can't imagine what that whole what that looks like 
Um, yeah. Have you heard of, I'm sure you have, Kowalski's Markets up in Minneapolis area? Yeah. And they, I love what they do because they actively want and seek out, they're looking for the local yeah. companies and, and growers and producers of the foods. And that's what they want on their shelves. So when you go to one of their stores to shop, you can find a lot of locally grown, whether in produce or on the shelves, like yeah. your oats. It'd be great to find find your product there. Yeah. <laughs> Kowalski's. Um, even, you know, some of the largest retailers in the country have shifted to regional, locally produced food. And it's, it, it isn't as profitable for them and, and it isn't, you know, as easy for them, but they're doing it because their customers want it. So let's talk retail. I always have oats on my shelf because I bake a lot. <laughs> so does that make it healthy? No, but <laughs> I monster cookie bars, monster cookies. I have caramel, caramel apple bars that have oats in them, all kinds of bars, cookies, um, apple crisp. I use it in the topping peach crisp. I use it in the topping. So I know some people will add a little bit of oats, like the instant oats, or maybe the regular, regular ones to meatloaf or burgers to kind of mm -hmm. Or barbecue, I guess my mom used to do that, add that to her barbecue meat to kind of extend how many people that it will feed. But, and I, one thing to note too, is you guys do differently instead of in that, uh, like the canister of oats, you're doing your oats in bags. How, why do you do that? Uh, you know, one thing when you start a small company, you, you're you limited in the choices you have to use for packaging. Mm. Um, so um, the canister is a real staple. I mean, that's what a lot of companies use. It's almost, it's really cost prohibitive to ship empty canisters. Most of them are made at the plant where they fill them because of their round. There's a lot of airspace. And so like we can ship our bags in here, you know, one pallet. Well, I don't know how many truckloads of canisters you take to, to be the same, you know? <laughs> right. So right. that's, that's one of them. And, and, you know, we get, we get picked on a little bit by consumers. We'll get letters once in a while about that, that, well, you, you should, you know, sell it mm -hmm. something that's recyclable. Well, if you look at our bag, it's low density polyethylene. If you weigh our bag, it's very similar in weight to the plastic lid that goes on the canister. Oh, okay. So not only is that canister using the same amount of plastic, they're also using a cardboard container, you know, right, right. Um, just the, the efficiency of shipping makes our, our package very efficient that way. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, that's one of the things you kind of have to, you know, when you're low volume, just starting out, there's very few companies that want to deal with a tiny, small company. And typically they'll make a few small runs for you, hoping you grow and grow into a reliable customer for them. So, you, you mm -hmm. know, you can find the right ones, but it's really limited finding a lot of times you'll make a patch packaging choice based on who, who will actually do it for you. Okay. Yeah. I had to think about that. Okay. Where well, I have my canister. And then if I do the bags, I like the idea of the bags though, because you're only using up shelf space for as much oats are left in the bag. Yeah, and the, the canister you know, the, can have only a fourth a cup left in it, yeah. and you're still taking up shelf space for this yeah. big canister that hardly has any oats left in it. Yeah. So I like the idea of the bags. Yeah, the challenge with like with our bags is resealing. You know that that can be an issue if you don't mm -hmm. use it real fast. Making sure it's sealed up. Um, we've looked. You know, we're always looking at ways to improve that. You know, they they do make bags with the resealable zipper on them. Um, there's just more cost mm -hmm. there. I mean, there's um, we've looked at. You know, like well maybe you know, we make an offering with like a, you know, a container that, you know, they can buy once and the 40 ounce bag will fit in it. So then they can, you know, ensure it's sealed good. But yeah, there's a lot of challenges as a small company when you start things like that. Sure. And I was just going to say, I have my sugar and my flour and my cocoa, and I have a lot of things in my pantry that are all in big glass jars or can't like big canisters, that kind of thing. Cause flour, I don't, that doesn't, I don't like to reseal that sugar, that kind of thing. I don't keep them in the bags anyway. And so it just gives you a reason to buy a pretty jar and then just always have your yeah. jar with your oats, right? Yeah. Keep some fresh. I like your branding too. It's very just clean and natural and very pretty. I like it. All right. So retail where you talked about some of the stores, do you, 
okay, so people can buy your product online. So if they're like, oh, I want to try this, I can't find it in my store. First of all, they can go to anthemoats.com. They can purchase online. And then do you have, I didn't look to see, do you have a spot on there where like a store locator so people can look to see if it's in their area? No, we don't. We, okay. Um, we've talked well, then about I'm sorry it. I brought it up. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's all right. It's something that we get reached out to. There's a lot of companies that offer that service where they'll, you know, they'll give you the store locator. Um, it costs money to do that. We've, yeah. we've, you know, looked into putting lists together. And one of the problem with lists is like, well, you know, when you're in the large distributors, like we are, you'll show up in a store and not, not know you're there. And then oh. um, if they quit carrying it, then it's hard to keep up on, on that. Mm -hmm. um and we i mean we've been in places where we don't even know how they got our oatmeal <laughs> um i've had people like you know well delta sky mall they're like yeah i had your super fruit cup and i had no really? idea i don't know how they had to pull one of, from one of the distributors we're in but um so when you get in those national distributors it's it's really hard to keep an eye on who's pulling product there mm -hmm. so what do you recommend what for people um, listening because this podcast is obviously it goes everywhere, but we, we talk a lot about Midwest and do they just look in their store or can they email you and ask, do you, you know, if somebody said, do you have anything in say if they're in Ankeny, Iowa or something, like, can you answer the question about where they're close? Yeah. Like, you know, Ankeny, we're, we have some cups in, in hy -Vee. But to see all of our products, the, the easiest way to be, you know, go on our website. Um, typically, they can probably buy it off our website and have it shipped to their house as cheap as in the grocery store. Okay. Because um, a lot of the distributors have a pretty hefty freight rate that gets added to their pricing and stuff. So um, we've noticed that in the areas like Dallas area where we're in Central Market, United we have a lot of online sales and, and okay. in those areas where we're in those stores. And I don't know exactly why, other than I, th I think we're fairly price competitive. They can order it right on online. Sure. So, okay. Now, if somebody listening is interested in carrying your products, how should they get in touch with you? Yeah, they, um, they can just email us um, either through our website. They can reach out or our emails are Cassandra at, at anthemotes.com or taylor at anthemotes.com. Okay. I'll put those in the show notes as well. But yeah, you're, and we're, you're we absolutely love direct stores, direct ship. That's a focus of ours moving forward. Um, we just, okay. It's so much better relationship working directly with, with, you know, with stores than, than dealing through distributors. And so yeah, anybody yeah, that would want to carry a product, we, we absolutely would love to talk to them. And your shelf stable, so there's no, um, you know, so if somebody has a store, but it's maybe not a, a a grocery store, right? Typical, but they have local products that they like to add to their shelves. They they could add Anthem Notes because you you're not you don't need a refrigerator or anything like that. Right. So anybody could carry you, like my local hardware store right here in Lake Benton. Yeah. <laughs> right? They could have it. All right. Well, I want to ask, do you have a couple, do you have some recipes that you want to share? Um, we, <laughs> we use ours a lot of times in some energy bottles that we like to make. We use the steel cut oats in those. The steel cut the oats in them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I do not have that recipe with me at the moment, but I can get it to you. Yep. It's quite popular while we serve them. <laughs> sure. Um, but, and like you, I always put it in my meatloaf and meatballs and things like that. And and then, of course, the cookies and the monster bars and like, all the healthy things. So. Right. <laughs> Steel cut in the energy or the protein balls, whatever. I hadn't thought of that before. My daughter will eat the steel cut oats, but I haven't gotten myself to do that yet. So, I Steel cut's my favorite. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. It's a little okay. longer cooked, but to me, the flavor is just, I really like the flavor in the texture of it. Um, that with a little bit of fruit. It, to me is probably the best. My son, who is 22, almost 23 here, he's been doing overnight oats, which, which shocked me because I'm like, I never made that for you. And how did you, you know, but they they have TikTok, right? That's all they need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we'll start to um, come to the end here, but I have a few more questions. And 
first of all, I want to make sure that everybody knows where they can follow you or find you. So we said anthemotes.com, but what's your social media? We're on pretty much all, all the platforms, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Yeah, right. Face, Facebook, Instagram are, are the most active. Um, yeah. I do the TikTok one, and I've done a real lousy job of keeping up on it. I'm this year going to do a little better job. I want to try and do every Friday. I want to do a video out in an oat field just to kind of show the progression of it through the. That'd be really cool. Stuff. So yeah, so I hope you do. My... Now I'm going to be watching. We're all going to yeah. be watching. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. Friday mornings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's one piece of advice for people who are interested in starting um, a food business, I guess? Is there anything you could pass on? Yeah. Um, you know, there's, I could go on for hours on all the mistakes we made, you know, starting out and going through it. The one thing I would, I would caution is, is we used a consultant company to kind of help develop a brand, which worked beautiful. Um, it really where it really started to stray from what we wanted to do was in in development and launch um mm. and through really no fault of their own but you know most of the companies they help start up almost all of them aren't legacy based they're looking for a big score so they want to just blow this thing up throw tons of money at it have it get to you know 10 20 million dollars in sales and then pepsi go come and buys you out and you all mm -hmm. take your money, you know, and we, we got led down a path. I really, we just did not, we should not have been going down. We, you know, we're in this for the long haul. We want slow growth. We want legacy. We, you know, so that's one caution I would throw out there is I would lean more. If I had it to do over again, I'd lean more on some of our local ag value added, you know, startup aids like uh, South Dakota value added ag is a great one. Um, Start small, could control what you do, how you do it, and make sure you're going down a path that aligns with with your vision and what you want the future to look like. That would be my caution to, to someone doing it. You can any anybody in sales or anybody you hire like that, they have one thing in mind, and that is to just spend your money and blow this mm -hmm. thing out, you know, as big as mm -hmm. they can, as fast as they can. Because that's how they get paid. So it, right. you have to really be cautious about that. I think that's great advice. And the other part of it that is included in what you just said is all the mistakes that you made, but look at where you've come. So I think to just know it's okay, you're going to make mistakes Yeah. and it's okay. It doesn't mean it ends everything. You're still here and you're still growing and making a wonderful product. So yeah. it seems like it's, we all know it's okay to make mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, one thing when you look in the food, you know, in the food space, I've come across a lot of brands and all most of the ones that that build a, a brand and enter are good. They're good products. They're good. The reasons they fail is usually other things. That's very, you know, just just the reality of it is, you know, in, in our industry, over 80% of the companies that start up fail. Yeah. And it isn't because they didn't have a good product. It's all these other little things that can pick away at you and and mm -hmm. uh, burn you out or cost you enough money to where, you, you know, you have to fold up. And, and uh, so mm -hmm. it's... It's a very challenging landscape. Well, we all know that ag is very physical work. It's mentally taxing. You have unpredictability. There's the weather. You have volatile markets. So many things in agriculture. And we know that here in the Midwest. What keeps you going on the days where things flood or there's a drought? Uh, you know, for, for me, it's my wife and children. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, it's just... Uh, it's a great thing to be able to work, you know, with, with your, with your wife and your children every day and share that. Um, I love watching things grow, even as frustrating as mother nature can be at times. <laughs> you learn really quickly to, you know, you control the things you can and don't worry about the things you cannot control. Um, just how you react to them. And, you know, I've always said in agriculture, it's some of the most miserable people I know, and some of the happiest people I know are, are producers. <laughs> and it's all about how you approach it. And I wish everyone could have just seen Cassandra's beautiful smile when <laughs> you said that. You guys are just lovely. <laughs> Great couple. And you have to work together. I mean, what's that could be a whole nother podcast, right? Working with your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> running a company with your spouse and still being able to say really nice things at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's next? How do you want to see Anthem Oats grow? Do you have any new products coming or anything like that? Or is it to get into the get to consumers? Yeah, you know, we want to focus more on small stores, direct ship, direct to consumer. Um, we kind of got pushed into national distribution and, and it's it really isn't where our heart belongs. Um, I don't know if we'll stop that or just kind of hit a pause where we're at, but um, that's going to be a shift for us. We just, we love working with small stores and, and direct to consumers. Um, our growth is, is going to be a little smaller because of that, but it's going to be way more enjoyable. And uh, so that's, that's one direction for us. Um, flavor wise, you know, super fruits are best flavor in the cups and maple in the cartons. We need to cross those over and get them offered in the other lineups. Oh. So um, that to me, is an easy one we're looking at and getting done here shortly. And, uh, and then it's, it's time, I think, to look at a couple new flavors and kind of realigning that way, maybe. So okay, those are things that we'll be working on in the next year, hopefully. We'll be watching for that. What, what do you think that your grandfathers would say? And you have all these generations that used to farm. What would they say to you with what you're doing now? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think they would like certain things about it and really, you know, getting into this whole arena, I, I think they would wonder what, what was wrong with me too, in, in a way, <laughs> you know, cause it's not something that <clears throat> it's just changed. Agriculture changed yeah. so much. Um, but you know, you look back when, you know, when people first homesteaded here, they relied on a cream check, you know, selling cream to the, you know, in the oh. local towns. There was a lot of value added agriculture and vertical integration back then. And, and I, I think that part of it, they would like to see, hmm. you know, renewed. What do you most want people to know about your company? Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I think, uh, I, you know, the one thing I, I hope consumers know about us is, is, our commitment to growing a product that that they they know is good for them, they know is safe, they know it's produced by you know a small family that cares about the product that we turn out. Everything tastes better when your heart is in it. Is there anything else you guys want to add? No, I mean I appreciate the chance to come in and visit. I mean we we love talking about our our product and company and and how we got here and. I just, I love local products. I love learning about, well, families. I mean, we're all just Midwest people and can sit down and just have a cup of coffee together and talk about what you're doing. And I want to spread the word and, and get people to, to try, try your products. And so anyway, thank you guys very much for spending time with us and sharing. And I do hope that people will go to anthemotes.com and fill their shopping cart and try out the different products because I know I need some more already. <laughs> Taylor and Cassandra, thank you very much for, for coming on and sharing your story today and a little bit about your family as well. Thank you so much for having us, Stacey. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I'm glad Taylor dared to disregard advice not to go into farming and that he fell in love with oats and Cassandra. Links to today's recipes and resources are in the show notes and on randomsweets.com. For the next episode, we're sticking with the agriculture theme on the prairie <laughs> as we hear from Donna Burnt of Burnt Family Produce near White, South Dakota. And if you're the kind of person who likes to jump ahead, I'm working on episodes with Jan Sanderson from Sanderson Gardens outside of Brooking, South Dakota, and Carolyn McGovern and Katie Leip from the Twin Cities chapter of For Goodness Cakes. And as long as you've subscribed to Funeral Potatoes and Wilmittens, your podcast app will let you know when they're available. I'm your host, Stacey Mergenthal. Sweet wishes. <laughs>